I want to talk about London um, as a, really it's become a thoroughfare for high finance and capital. Uh, and um, when you look at the social fallout of that, wh what do you see? And I, I really, I, I want to guide you in a sense towards um, land speculation, housing, and how ordinary Londoners can now go about their lives. Because if you are, if you, for instance, got a flat here uh, and you, do, you live here for two weeks a year, you're not in any way spending any money into this economy. You're not sending your kids to the local schools and all the stuff that we know, uh, you know fr from um, absentee owners. Um, so what's your view on London housing and how finance has negatively or positively affected that? Well, the, the London housing is clearly a, a disaster in terms of um, the way it's beginning to... Actually, maybe that's too strong. It's on the cusp of being a disaster. Um, because London's changed in lots of positive ways. And it's unmistakably more energetic, more diverse, more interesting city than it used to be. I think, though, that the, the trends are heading in the wrong direction. And I think that housing is the nub of it. Um, just for a very simple reason that you ordinary citizens can't really afford to live here anymore. I think they've forgotten what the multiple is. You probably know it better. Is it 15 times earnings? The current, yeah. If, if and, and, that, and that, by the way, is a, a re very realistic. That isn't a sensational statistic. Yeah. The 15 times average earnings for a house price, and I think the historic norm is about three, isn't it? Three and a half. And uh, certainly when I moved to London, um, I got a mortgage on my first flat in, in 1987. It was, it was three and a bit. Um, and it seemed expensive enough then. Um, and so we're heading into territory which is historically unprecedented, um, where the ordinary citizens of the country just very straightforwardly can't afford to live in their own capital city. And I think the consequence of that we're only uh, beginning to see. Now, it may be that there's a gigantic bus coming. There was a report, UBS had a report earlier this week um, that had num London as number one at the top of its bubble risk. Um, and they put the, I think, 90, the historic comparisons were suggested a 95% risk of a collapse of above 30% in the next three years. And to be honest, that feels about right. But, you know, when I started writing my novel Capital, I started writing about 2005, and I started that thinking there was going to be a bust in London property. Um, and, um, you know, I was right that there was a kind of bust coming, but I was completely wrong about the, the main place where it happened. There's a lovely bit uh, in the book, uh, and, and you have, a, dare I say, a bit of an obsession with people who dig out their basements. I don't know if I'd call it an obsession, but I got very interested in it because it's one of the things that's changed, you know, that it didn't used to happen and now it does. And the, the number of things that are interesting about basements, one of them is that I've seen at close hand, I've seen a few people do them, and they always have to move. <laughs> well, after they've done it? it? Because it goes on so long. Oh, you mean they have to move out of the house? No, after, no uh, while it's happened, but after it's happened. They move? In the instances of directly, they always then sell the house because everybody hates them so much. <laughs> and there, there was a, an instance not far away that uh, the people who did it were Canadian and um, it took two years and they had to flip the house because, you know, they're... Because they've become so antisocial. Yeah, and it's... Uh, and it's it's such a gigantic fuck you to the community around you if you're doing that. Um, that that's one of the things that's interesting about it. That it, it sort of both it, it actually causes a form of social disintegration and it's also a symptom of it. Because they're called iceberg homes, I think. Because you see a tiny little thing on top and then there's this more solemn, really, underneath. I don't know what they've put, got in there, a sort of all-seater stadium and a... Yeah, and, you know... What goes in there? What cars, in there? cars, swimming pools. So all their badges of efficiency, as Veblen would call you know, whatever they can acquire from the real economy, they just stick under their house. And I think there's also a thing about it being, like, um, the idea, the way that Bond villains are in the James Bond movies, that's actually a sort of aspirational notion of what you should be like. So are the white cat, are the people... Stroking white cats. I don't know about the cats, but the, the underground lair aspect. You know, that if you haven't got an underground lair, you're not, you know, you're somehow not a player. And, and it's obviously mad. It's mad to have houses descending sort of six stories into the earth um, that would manifestly have this sort of, <coughs> you know, were built and embody a kind of different way of living. And um, 
So they did, uh, and then the thing, actually, the thing that really snagged my attention was the thing a surveyor pointed out was because the earth is compressed um, quite severely by the weight of the house above. So as it's brought out, it expands. So you get something like five times as much. So if you have 20 cubic metres of space, you get 100 cubic metres of earth coming out. And I thought there was something wonderful about that image about the earth kind of throwing up into the skips outside these houses. Maybe that's a second Isle of Wight could be created on the south coast of Britain and it's just all the muck out of every basement in London. All, all the, the Miyazaki Museum in Tokyo, um, uh, the wonderful Japanese filmmaker Hiyao Miyazaki, Miyazaki has a museum and one of the attractions at it is just a gigantic mound of sand. Children love it, they wrap and play with it. So we could just have that somewhere in, somewhere in central London, just a mountain of earth uh, dug up from outside houses yeah. and people could sort of... Like the, pyra- like the pyramids, people go look at it and think, Jesus, I wonder what that's what, for. What was that? It was what was that about? The other really um, dark element to all this is that um, the diggers used to dig all that stuff out aren't retrieved anymore because it's not worth the cost to the builder uh, to pull the digger out of the sixth uh, um, level down. So archaeologists in however many years' time and economic historians will look back and say, God, that really was an era of misallocated capital. They didn't even retrieve the digger. Or they'll think, they'll, they'll study it and then come to the conclusion that we worship diggers. <laughs> and that we were a kind <laughs> of mass, Aztec. you know, digger cult civilization. And, you know, you could argue it's not necessarily that wrong as what scientists call a first order approximation. It's kind of. And the first shares to go down when there's going to be a global recession of Caterpillar. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, uh, your, your leading indicator. Um. Are we living in the era of misallocated capital? I think that's one of the ways of describing it. I mean, how, I think how better describe it? Because when you say that, people go, oh, what does that mean? Like, make it easier for me. I, th- I think the way I put it is that you know, the, you know, the V&A used to have those ads uh, that upset purists. Um, when you said, and the poster was um, a really ace calf with quite a nice museum attached. You know. And I think the, the equivalent thing about Britain is it's a... It's a whatever the words, a really frenetic property market with a real economy attached. Yeah, and that we've, you know, that the, the, whatever metaphor you want to use, tail wags the dog or um, things are sort of the wrong way round, that, that the um, housing market and specifically the amount of capital it sucks up are this sort of gigantic um, tapeworm. And so the, you know, the economics of the housing market are completely central and that ends up taking over the country's politics because people are profoundly loss averse. They, they love the idea of their house, as people were saying, earning more than they do and kind of just of its own accord and effortlessly going up in value. But similarly, they absolutely loathe the idea of their wealth. I mean, the wealth that they did nothing to earn because it's just encapsulated in the house of bleeding away when property prices go down. So you end up with all sorts of you know, misincentives and um, uh, erroneously designed policies whose whole purpose is just to keep people, you know, in their happy place when their house prices are going up. Property owning democracy has been a very powerful idea, hasn't it? Um, and it's laughable in, insofar as it's barely achievable now. Yeah. It's because the Germans don't uh, attach democracy, or the idea of democracy, to property ownership. And they have a mobile workforce, they can get around the country, they can get to where the work is, they're not owned by their houses. We, but it's an odd thing, though. I mean, Britain's always been obsessed with property rights historically, property more broadly defined, obviously, than just your house. Um, but yeah, it, d- it does have all sorts of distorting things, and it, and it has severe impacts on, as you say, free movement of labour and big intergenerational impacts. Because I mean, I, I see it now with um, I'm going to get to the point where lots of my friends' kids go off to university, and people are cheering and whooping at the thought of their house price going up and then their children go off to college and three years later they move back in and they suddenly realise that the same system that's so fantastic has created a bunch of boomerang kids. Their, yeah, their house has quintupled in value or whatever it is over the last couple of decades but then suddenly their, their children actually are facing a completely different future from the one they thought um, you know, for the exact, same, the exact same causal mechanism. And I think that, you know, there's plenty more where that came from in terms of the kind of generational knock-on effect of just, you know, a capital city where people can't afford to live. Mm-hmm.